Okay, so this is, uh, this is Matthew for Beginners. Matthew for Beginners, lesson one. This is the introductory lesson to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, I want to explain the for beginners here. The for beginners part of the title does not mean that these lessons will be oversimplified. It means that I'm going to teach about Matthew's Gospel with the notion that you haven't studied the Gospel of Matthew at all or in a while. Uh, I know I've taught some things about Matthew, but the parables in Matthew and other, uh, other type of uh, uh, materials, the kingdom, you know, idea of the kingdom in Matthew, but this is going to be a, a, a real study of the Gospel of Matthew itself as Matthew has, uh, has written it. So um, oh, rather than being oversimplified, think complete. This will be a complete study. Uh, and in our study, we're going to take time to examine the, you know, the social, the historical settings um, that existed when the gospel was produced, because Matthew, obviously, a man of his time, influenced by his times, uh, even though he was inspired, you know, God uses the individual as that individual is to write what he wants to write. Uh, we're also going to take a look at the author himself and how the book came to be included in the official New Testament canon. And that'll give us a, 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 an opportunity to study how did books make their way into the New Testament canon? Why, did, why were some chosen and others rejected? Be a good opportunity to do that. And I'll also show you how, to, how the book is divided and review some of the reasons why it was written and how it was used in the early church. This book was used in a particular way in the early church. Now we're not going to have time to read everything in class, but I'm going to give you reading assignments each week. I mean, they're not going to be very long, but um, um, you'll be able to uh, read ahead, uh, as Carrie mentioned, read ahead a couple of chapters so that we won't have to read all of the chapters uh, in class. All right, let's take a look at the historical background of Matthew's writing. There are four main political historical periods which shape the thinking of the people when Jesus arrived on the scene of human history uh, and the scene which uh, Matthew will record in his gospel. So very, uh, very briefly, oh yeah, I got to go one more time here. There we go, there we go. Uh, the first the historical period, the uh, Persian period, 536 to 336 BC. Uh, by then the uh, southern kingdom of uh, Judea had been exiled to Babylon in 586 uh, BC. God finally grew weary of their idolatry, their disobedience. The northern kingdom had been exiled and dispersed uh, uh, centuries before. Now it was uh, the turn of the southern kingdom, 586 BC. And while they're in Babylon in exile, Babylon itself fell, their kingdom fell to the Persians in 539 BC. So very interesting, the Jews were captive under two world powers here. First the Babylonians and then the Persians that took over from the Babylonians who kept them uh, in captivity. Uh, another interesting thing that took place while they were in captivity is that synagogue worship began not in Judea but actually began while they were in captivity before the Jews went to the temple uh, to uh, offer sacrifice, to pray, and so on and so forth, no need. But when they were in, uh, in exile in Babylon, uh, the temple had been destroyed, the city had, was in ruins, they couldn't, they couldn't worship in the temple, there was no temple, and they themselves were uh, captives in a foreign land, and so they began, quote, house churches. You know, they began house churches, they began synagogues, places for prayer. And the synagogue idea and the synagogue movement began while they were in Babylonian uh, captivity and it was kept up when they finally returned, when they were returned back from exile. So uh, historically, eventually a small remnant returned to rebuild the city and the temple in and around 520 BC and others followed to resettle the land uh, over the next century. So it wasn't they were in exile and then all of a sudden they all came back. It was they were in exile and a few came back and then another group came back and then another group came back. They came back sporadically 
over the next century, and not all of them came back. Many of them stayed in Babylon because they were there for generations, and they, you know, they had businesses, they had farms, they had, you know, the, it was home. And so they didn't all uh, come back to uh, Jerusalem. So when we read you know, the uh, books of uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and Malachi, those writers write about that period of restoration uh, from uh, Babylonian captivity. The final book of the Old Testament is the uh, book of Malachi, and it was written at about uh, this uh, particular time. Uh, after Malachi, we have, the, um, we have the, um, what's called the intertestamentary period uh, that lasts for about 400 years, uh, where there is no inspired books that are produced, but a lot of historical and diverse religious styles are produced. So it's not that nothing was written, it was that there were no prophets, there were no inspired books written from the period of Malachi to John the Baptist, which is about 400 years. However, there was a lot of material that was produced. And it's important to kind of look at these because they influenced the thinking of the Jews in the first century or in the time when Jesus arrived. So let's take a look at those. So diverse, non-inspired writings. Uh, there are, first of all, the historical books which record the social and political movements of the Jewish people at that time. For example, there's Josephus, who was a contemporary of uh, Jesus. He was a Pharisee and a historian by training, and he records the history of the Jewish people during that time. And he writes about Jesus, this Nazarene who was executed as an insurrectionist, you know, Totally, not re totally rejecting the idea that Jesus is the Son of God or anything like that. He's just writing objectively what's going on politically and socially during that time. And his writings are available to us today. I have a copy of Josephus or part of Josephus' writings. He's the one that writes about James, for example. That's how we know that James, the brother of Jesus, the one who wrote the epistle, uh, was, uh, was uh, killed. He was thrown from the top of the wall uh, around Jerusalem. He was thrown down into the rocks and apparently, according to his record, uh, James didn't die right away, so the Jews went down and they stoned him to make sure that he had uh, died, a very terrible death. But we don't, we, that's not recorded in the Bible. You only know that if you read uh, Josephus, for example. Uh, also the writing of the Maccabees, the first and second Maccabees, the history of the Jewish uh, uprising uh, during that period of time, and I'll talk about that a little later. So there were the historical books that were written during that intertestamentary, some people say intertestamental, either, either way is okay. Uh, other uh, material uh, are commentaries. Uh, commentaries, the Talmud, for example, which was a collection of rabbinic teachings concerning the Jewish law. So get it straight, the Torah, is the Jewish word for the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch are the first five books of the Bible, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the first five books. Sometimes we refer to those five books as the Pentateuch, a Greek term, penta, five. Five books, right? The Pentateuch. Well, the Torah, the word Torah, is the Jewish word for these first five books. So when they're talking about the Torah, they're talking about the law, they're talking, the Jews are talking about the first five books of the Bible, all right? The Talmud, that's where it's confusing, uh, confusing, the Talmud is a commentary written by rabbis about the Torah, okay? Commentary written by Jewish rabbis concerning the books of the law, the first five books of the Bible. And then the word Mishnah is another commentary that's within the Talmud, all right? So uh, we don't have to you know, memorize all these things. I'm just trying to explain to you that during that time there began to be commentaries, not inspired writings, commentaries uh, written by uh, scribes, by, by, by students of the word uh, about what they believed, the, the, how the law should be applied in various uh, situations. Again, we'll talk about that a little more uh, as we go on. Then there were, um, uh, diverse non-inspired writings uh, called the Apocrypha, the word Apocrypha means hidden, and these were stories and accounts of events and people in Jewish history that are not recorded in the inspired books. For example, the history of Susanna, 
a character of that time, not mentioned in any Old Testament record, not mentioned in any New Testament record, but written about by writers during this period of time. Or the wisdom of Solomon. We, we don't have a book in the Old Testament, you know, canon, entitled The Wisdom of Solomon. But a, a book like that was written, referring back to Solomon. A first and second Esdras, or uh, other um, additions to the book of Esther, for example. Um, you know, sometimes people say, my friend has a Catholic Bible. Is that Bible any good? You know, they say a Catholic Bible. And the reason they say a Catholic Bible is that many versions authorized by the Catholic, many versions of the Bible authorized by the Catholic Church include these books. So you've got the Old Testament, you know, Genesis all the way to Malachi, and then before you get to the New Testament, there are a whole bunch of other books, and you wonder, what are these books? Well, these are the Apocrypha. They include many of these books between the Old and New Testament in their version of the Bible, in their collection of Bible books, but we have to understand. So people say, is that book any good? Well, of course it is. It's the same Old Testament and it's the same New Testament that we use, you know, uh, New American Standard or New Revised or New International Version or whatever. It's the same book, except they've just added these other editions in between the Old and New Testament. The thing to remember is that these books are non-inspired, all right? And then we have another uh, type of book entitled um, uh, 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 Pseudepigrapha, uh, Pseudepigrapha meaning false, you know, false. These were works that were written using the name of Old Testament writers long after their deaths. For example, there's a book entitled The Revelation of Moses. Well, the Revelation of Moses was not written by Moses, but people would take the name of a Bible character and attach it to their book to uh, give it more circulation value, more authenticity, if you, if you wish. And usually these books here in the Pseudepigrapha were written in the apocalyptic style. If you were in other classes, like Daniel Revelation, you know that the apocalyptic style okay, is, um, uh, is a style of writing, is a literary style uh, that uses a lot of metaphors, uh, you know, a lot of uh, fantastic language, the blood was, uh, the moon was filled with blood, the stars fell, you know, so on and so forth, uh, that we see in Daniel, for example, in the book of Revelation. That's uh, uh, apocalyptic type literature. Well, these books here in, in the Pseudepigrapha, many of them are written in this particular style. So these writings between 400 BC and the arrival of Christ the thing I'm trying to get across here is that they influenced the thinking of the people and much of Jesus' teaching was done to counteract the false ideas that people had drawn from this type of literature here. That's the point I'm trying to get across, okay? Uh, the Talmud, for example, you know, that commentary on the, on, the, on the Torah, the commentary on the first five books of the Bible that had been written by Jewish scribes, the Talmud with the many restrictions about the Sabbath that were not found in the actual Bible itself, but were imposed on the people. So a lot of the things that the people were, you know, had to do according to, quote, the law, wasn't according to the law at all. It was according to uh, the commentary on the law, all right? Uh, people also were learning and basing much of their religious thought on commentaries and their hopes on the end times scenarios rather than the prophets. In other words, a lot of these books were talking about when the end time was coming, when the Messiah was coming. It, it was almost like science fiction. And so a lot of their thoughts you know, were, were you know, uh, their thoughts about the coming Messiah were based on these type of writings instead of carefully studying what the prophets were saying. And so that's why they had such a mistaken idea of, or a confused idea on who the Messiah was supposed to be because they had so many contradicting ideas uh, that were, they were, uh, you know, they were uh, consuming uh, through, this type of, uh, through this type of literature. Okay, so that gives you that intertestamentary period there and some of the things going on there. Uh, another uh, era, if you wish, you had the Persian era, 536, 336 BC, and then the intertestamentary period. Then you had the Greek period, 333 to 167 BC, the time of Alexander the Great and his legacy. 
After uh, Alexander's death, we know that his kingdom was divided among his four generals. And um, as far as we're concerned in the study of Matthew, we need to understand that Palestine was under different control for two centuries of the Greek world domination. In other words, the Greek dominated the world, but that little strip of land we call Israel was fought over by regional powers at the time, okay? North and south. And so from, um, from uh, let's, let's get another slide up here. From uh, 320 to 198, Egypt controlled Palestine or Israel, okay? They were in control. Egypt was under domination by Greece, but Palestine was under regional control, local control by Egypt. Uh, I should go down here. <laughs> Egypt is south, okay? And then from 198 to 167 uh, uh, BC, uh, Syria, the country to the north of Palestine, gained control over that region. And the reason that these, the north and the south, were always fighting is because they wanted to control that piece of land as a buffer zone between them and their enemies. They wanted to be, you know, it's always easier to fight a war on somebody else's turf, right? You destroy their homes, you burn their crops, and so on and so forth. So they always wanted that, that middle piece of land we call Israel, they wanted that to stage their, their wars and so on and so forth. So they fought back and forth. So from 198 to 167 BC, Syria was in control of, that, uh, of Palestine. And one king in particular, his name was Antiochus Epiphanes, um, he was really trying to destroy and demoralize the Jewish people. And what he did is he closed the temple. He closed the temple and then he went in and he sacrificed a pig on the altar, knowing about knowing Jewish religious custom and so on and so forth, knew that that would desecrate the temple and the area and so on and so forth. And then he forbade circumcision. You weren't allowed to circumcise children. In other words, he was trying to you know, completely destroy, not just the people economically, but he was trying to destroy them psychologically by destroying uh, their religion. So it was a time of great, great uh, depression and great trouble for the people of, uh, of Judah at that time. Uh, another thing that uh, was interesting is in a larger sense uh, the Greeks controlled, you know, it was their time of domination and it wasn't just a military domination but it was also a cultural domination. I mean Greek ideas and Greek philosophy and Greek language and Greek art and Greek religion and Greek literature you know, was just being diffused throughout the uh, throughout their empire, throughout the world, and it had an effect on the Jews. What happened uh, for the Jews was they began to forget how to speak Hebrew because they were influenced. And I mean, that's really easy to understand. I'm looking around, but everybody here was kind of born here, you know, but for people, well, like us, like uh, you know, our family, you know, our oldest ones still speak French because we originally come from Quebec, right? So we speak French and they speak French, but I doubt if our grandchildren are going to speak French. And I really doubt that our great-grandchildren you know, will speak French. Why? Well, they're, they're assimilated into the United States, which is an English-speaking country. They'll probably speak Spanish before they'll speak French, right? So the same thing was happening uh, in Israel, in Judah. People were being assimilated you know, by, the, by the Greek culture. They were forgetting to speak the old language, but there was a problem. Their whole life revolved around their religion, and their whole religion revolved around the scriptures. And if they couldn't read the scriptures, you know, they would cease to be as a people. And so what they did is they created a Greek version of the Old Testament, a Greek version of the Old Testament that we call the Septuagint. And we call it the Septuagint because 70 scholars were brought together to undertake the task of translating the Hebrew Old Testament into the Greek language. And so when you see the Roman numerals LXX, which represents 70, many times you know, in a text or something, usually what they're saying is this text is from the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old, of the Old Testament. Okay. Another period after this is the uh, Maccabean period, very interesting, from 167 to 63 BC. Notice we're, we're, we're working our way towards 
the arrival of Jesus, but all these things that happened in the world had an effect on the Jewish people and what Matthew's going to be writing about. This is the Maccabean period. The Maccabean period is, is known for the revolt against the Syrian control, against Syrian control. In other words, they had had enough of Syrian control and trying to destroy the religion, the people rose up. And uh, the Maccabees, that family, uh, uh, led that uh, insurrection, led that revolt. Also, there was a revolt against the Greek language and Greek influence. Uh, so the Jews enjoyed a brief period of independence from 167 to 135 BC. The revolt succeeded in pushing back the Syrian uh, king and the Syrian uh, influence uh, during, their, um, during their time. And during this period here, very interesting, new powers arose within Israel. You had the, you know, if you ever wonder, where do the Pharisees come from? You know, who are those guys? Where do they come from? Who are they? Well, what they were, they were scribes. I mean, that's what they did. And they belonged to a party called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, the word Pharisees simply means the, the called out people, okay? the separated ones. The Pharisees, that party begins during the Maccabean period. They were scribes who led the revolt and were considered saviors of the law and the protectors of the law against pagan Greek influences. So they were the ones in their day who said, let's go back to the Bible. They were the original ones who said, enough of Greek influence in our life and in our religion and in our culture and so on and so forth, enough the Syrians taking over, we need to go back to the scriptures and go just with the scriptures. And so they were heroes at the beginning. They were seen as heroes. They, they saved, if you wish, the, the, the way of life that the Jews had that was dictated by the, by the scriptures. So that's where they come from. Now we, if you understand that idea of how they started, it gives you great insight into why they, how they became, 100 years later, how they became what they became during Jesus' time because they were Jesus' greatest enemies. And yet at the beginning, they were, they were the hero of the people. And then of course the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the aristocratic upper class of priests who began to wield political power. They didn't always have political power because in Israel you know, there, were, there was the king, there was a king, and, 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 and then there were the priests. But then in Israel there was no king, there were no kings. You know, the, the, they were dominated by outside influences. And so what happened is that the priests took, you know, you know, took over, you know, there was a vacuum, no leadership. So the priests took over the secular leadership because they were wealthy, because they were well-educated, they were well-positioned and respected, so it was like a natural transference. But something very interesting happened when they did that. Traditionally, the priests were the ones charged by God to teach the people God's word. When they abandoned that role, they abandoned that role in order to take over political leadership. And the ones who stepped into their role was the Pharisees. They became the teachers of, of, the, of the people and began to have that kind of spiritual influence over, over the people. You know, it's a, it's a change that you don't recognize if you read very quickly, but that was a very significant thing that took place at that time during the Maccabean period. We also have a group called the Essenians or the Essenes. The Essenes were monks, if you wish. They were desert dwellers and they saw Jerusalem as a place of corruption. The priests were corrupt, the Pharisees were corrupt, you know, the Greek influence, they, they wanted to just you know, escape all of it, if you wish. And so they lived in a commune, they lived in a in a community like monks. And what they did was they recorded copies of the Old Testament Hebrew, not Greek, but the Old Testament Hebrew and Aramaic writings, and they sealed them in protective earthen jars, 
and they hid those jars in caves near the Dead Sea. And the reason they did that is that they were afraid that there would be some sort of cataclysmic military thing that would happen where either the north or the south or the Greeks or somebody would come in and destroy Jerusalem again and destroy the temple and destroy the scriptures. And so they wanted to protect the scriptures. So they were very careful in copying them. You know, they were scribes and so they copied the scriptures, hid them in caves, you know, uh, hope, ho hoping to uh, 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 guarantee that the scriptures would live on for another generation. Well, we know what happens, right? In 1947, a shepherd boy taking care of his sheep. You have to understand, if you go to that area near the Dead Sea and you look at the mountains, there are thousands of caves. We're not talking about huge caves. We're you know, enough where a person could crawl in with three or four sheep or something. There are thousands of those things all over, dotting the countryside. So a boy uh, in 1947 you know, goes into one of those caves and stumbles across a jar that's broken. He opens it up, and there's a scroll inside, he gets it, he brings it to you know, Jerusalem or this, uh, the city, I forget if it was Egypt, Cairo, Egypt, Jerusalem, anyway. So he brings it to a, you know, a, a merchant and lo and behold, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so they go back and they begin to examine all these caves and they begin to find all these scrolls, hermetically sealed for, for almost 2,000 years, protected against moisture and wind and so on and so forth in the dark, in the cave. And if you see them, I've seen them. When I was in Israel, I was at the museum. They have the, the you know, Dead Sea Scrolls and you see them like they're in behind you know, climate control glass cases, you know, and you see the entire scroll. Yeah, I can't read it, it's in Hebrew obviously, but you see this is, this is the original thing. What's amazing is one of the scrolls, Isaiah, right? You take out your, your New American Standard or your whatever, you know, and you flip over to Isaiah, and if you could read the, the, you know, the same language, it's exactly the same thing. One of the strongest arguments for the continuity of Scripture. And so, that was the, uh, the Essenians, that was their contribution to that time. The reason I say that is that there was a lot of political you know, stuff going on, end time scenarios, the end is coming, you know, a, lot of, a lot of stuff happening. These guys out in the desert thinking that the end was going to come, they were writing the scriptures, trying to protect them, all the political turmoil going on in the city. And then of course you had the zealots, they were political activists and anarchists who wanted to continue the revolution. You know, the Maccabean revolution, we, you know, we have to stay in a perpetual state of revolution. Uh, uh, Barabbas, you know, the one that they released instead of Jesus, he was part of this group. And Simon, one of the apostles, was part of this group. And then you have the Herodians. The Her Herodians were a, a political party who were sympathetic to Herod. And some thought that he was the Messiah. Among the Herodians, they thought he was the savior. And you know what, in those days, uh, it, it, I could see them believing a thing like that because Herod was responsible for rebuilding the temple, bringing, it, bringing back its splendor. You know, he was a king, he was, you know, he was bringing back the temple, so on and so forth. You know, I could see some saying, yeah, this is the guy, he, you know, he's going to bring us back to greatness. So Israel was a hotbed of political activity. It was nurtured on writings during the intertestamentary period that speculated about the fantastic arrival of the Messiah. It was almost like science fiction. There was great expectancy. They were like a bomb, you know, ready to go, ready to blow up. And into this, Jesus enters. Okay, so now we get to the period of uh, the time when Jesus comes the Roman period, 63 to the New Testament period. Now the Romans, they simply destroyed Syria completely and they dominated Palestine. Uh, they established governors over Palestine. Uh, they sold the rights to collect taxes to individuals in the country. This is what they did in all countries. It wasn't anything new in Palestine, that's what they did, it was a lot easier. And of course, uh, the men who collected the tax, who purchased the license to collect the tax, uh, they were called publicans, right? 
And guess who was one of those guys? Well, Matthew. Matthew was a, a publican. Uh, Herod, of course, was called the king of the Jews. He was a Roman appointed governor, actually. Uh, he was a political ruler called a king. Uh, then you had Pontius Pilate. He was the military governor who supplied Roman, uh, a Roman guarantee, or excuse me, a, a guarantee of force, in other words, to collect the taxes and to put down rebellion. So there will be peace if you pay your taxes and if you do not rebel. If you don't pay your taxes and you give us trouble, then we wipe you out. This was the deal. Okay? There was no negotiating this deal and they kept a garrison of soldiers there just to make sure that the people understood what the deal was. All right, now we need to talk about the calendar. The calendar. <clears throat> You know, B.C., A.D., before Christ, the year of our Lord, okay? During the time of Jesus, the time at that time was calculated according to the Roman calendar. So the time was calculated according to the Roman calendar, the feasts were celebrated according to the Jewish calendar, but the years were according to the Roman calendar, okay? Um, the Roman calendar, calculated um, the year by referring to the founding of the city of Rome as year number one. And so when Jesus arrived, if you wish, it was year 753. It was 753 years after the founding of Rome. That was when Jesus was born, according to the Roman calendar. If you lived then and you know, uh, Jesus is in the manger, you know, and so on and so forth, and you turn to your buddy and said, well, what year is this? You know, he'd say, well, it's 753, according to Roman calendar. All right? After Christianity became the religion of the Roman world, the emperor Justinian requested that a new dating system be established using the birth of Jesus as year number one. Thinking, well, wait a minute, we are the Holy Roman Empire, we are a Christian empire, why should the calendar reflect you know, uh, the beginning of Rome, pagan Rome? Uh, our calendar should actually reflect our religion, the birth of our Lord. So let's make the year of our Lord year number one, and then we'll count, we'll count forward, okay? And so, um, uh, so the new dating system was established using Christ as year number one. Okay, now, so that meant with this adjustment, when this adjustment was made, the Roman year, they were in year 1279, according to the Roman calendar, okay? Since Jesus had been born in 753, which is Roman time, they reestablished the year in Christian terms to be 526, in other words, 526 years after the birth of Christ, this is when the new calendar, you know, this is going to be the date of the new calendar, when it's inaugurated, if you wish. Everybody following me so far, are we good? But then the problem was, there was a mistake. To complicate things even further, it was discovered that their calculations as to the year of Jesus' birth was in error. He was actually born in the year 749 Roman calendar, not 753 Roman calendar. See what I'm saying? But since the change had already been made to the new calendar, they just left everything as it was. So this means that according to the new calendar, Jesus was born in 4 BC. Okay, is that confusing enough for you? All right. So that's why you, know, you read secular books sometimes and they say, you know, Jesus Christ of Nazareth born 4 BC and you're going, how can Jesus be born four years before Christ? You know, that this is the reason why uh, this was done. So, so the Romans, of course, getting back to Rome, the Romans, of course, were cruel. They were ruthless rulers. But during their dominance, they provided important elements which actually supported the spreading of the gospel. For example, the Pax Romana. Between years 14 BC and 93 AD, there was 100 years of world peace. Now you, you, you say to yourself, nah, it's no big deal. When, how many wars have we had in the last 100 years? 
I mean, World War I, World War II, you know, Korea, Vietnam, uh, Iraq, Iran, you know, uh, not Iran, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Korea, I even left out Korea. And that's just wars that the United States ha has been involved in, not to mention wars between India and Pakistan. You know, there's wars everywhere, all the time, never ends, right? But from 14 BC to 93 AD, there were no wars. It was a period of relative peace, guaranteed by the might of the Roman army and the Roman Empire. Well, what did that mean? One of the things it meant was that there was freedom of movement. It means that the apostles, you know, given the gospel to go preach to all the world, had freedom of movement throughout the Roman Empire, which they would not have had had there been wars and civil strife and so on and so forth. So that's one of the things. Another thing that the Romans did, they had an excellent road system designed to move troops you know, from one, that's why it was originally designed, to, to move troops from one place to another. If there's some problems in the southern kingdom, in the east or west or whatever, they could move troops very, very quickly to put down uh, anything. You know, what's interesting is after World War II, uh, when uh, Mr. Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, started this tremendous road building uh, you know, process here in the United States, if you read you know, the history, uh, everyone says, yeah, and those roads you know, it started you know, motels, hotels, gas stations, it was great for the economy, but that was only the secondary reason for building roads across the United States. The primary reason that they were built were for defense purposes. This was a big country. The country had just gone through a war. They wanted to make sure that they could move armies around on our, you know, in our country easily in order to defend it. And so uh, during the time of the Romans, of course, it provided uh, excellent uh, traveling. Uh, also, a third thing uh, is that they, um, uh, in, during the Roman Empire, they maintained communication and a literary system uh, in, on a universal plane. In other words, the Greek language was universal uh, as the language of good literature and communication between cultures. All right, literature and culture still used the Greek language, even though it was the Romans. Uh, the Romans, however, used Latin as the language of the law, of Roman law. So we know that the New Testament was written in Greek, and it was easily spread on a well-maintained road system by a Roman citizen and a Christian missionary called Saul and Paul. So a little background about the eras. All right, a little bit more here, we're almost done. Show you a little map, you've probably got this map in your Bible. Um, key locations in Jesus' ministry. For example, uh, you know, uh, Jerusalem is here. And uh, you've, got, uh, you've got the Sea of Galilee where Jesus uh, lived, Capernaum up here in the north. This was the travel route back and forth <coughs> along the Jordan River, the Dead Sea over here. This is where the, the caves were. And so they traveled back and forth, not a very big strip of land, maybe 110 miles from you know, south to north, not a lot. 40 miles maybe, 40, 50 miles across, very, very small. But they did it on foot. They walked everywhere they uh, went. Some social situations taking place uh, at that time. People were poor. Judea was poorer than Galilee, actually. Uh, the religion was the center of life. It provided uh, the anticipation of freedom mixed with politics. Agricultural, it was an agricultural society at that time. Uh, Jerusalem had perhaps 250,000 people, which was extremely large for a city at that time, not just in the city, but you know, around Jerusalem. Uh, there was a high literacy rate at that time because Jewish children were taught to read because they had to read the law. And where did they learn to read? In the synagogues. Every city had a synagogue. Uh, Capernaum, where Jesus was born, uh, excuse me, where Jesus lived as an adult, 
uh, you know, every city had one synagogue. Well, they've discovered where the synagogue is in Capernaum. The archeologists have, and they, they have a dig there, and I've been there, I've walked in. Now they said the walls are gone, but the entranceways are still there, like the base wall is still there, and the floor is still there, and it's amazing. You, you can walk through, this is the door that they went through. This is the door that Jesus went through because he, as was his custom, at the synagogue, so it's a really, uh, really amazing, really ama ama amazing um, uh, experience. And there were class divisions uh, in that society. The aristocracy, as I say, were the priests, uh, and the priests only believed in the Pentateuch. In other words, they only accepted the first five books of the Bible as inspired. They didn't believe in angels, they did not accept the prophets, nothing like that. They were conservative religiously, but they were liberal socially. They, they accepted a lot of Greek ideas and so on and so forth. Then there were the Pharisees, they were the teachers, they were rabbis. Uh, they, on the other hand, believed in the prophets and believed in a resurrection from the dead. The common people came next, the publicans uh, and those who were sympathetic to Rome, sinners and then slaves at the very bottom. This is why crucifixion was so humiliating. It was a punishment only for slaves. You could, you, it was against the law to crucify someone who was a, a common person, for example, or even a, a, you know, somebody part of a Pharisee or a publican, you couldn't, you couldn't do that. Only, only slaves could be, uh, could be executed in that way. They did have a lot of social problems at the time. Uh, slavery, of course, open and practiced. Uh, some estimates 30 to 40 percent of the population of the Roman Empire uh, was in slavery. Um, there was no middle class, you know, except perhaps the military. Uh, military had some influence. Uh, divorce was rampant. Prostitution, cult prostitution uh, among Gentiles. Um, the idea of cult prostitution is that uh, sexual activity was required as part of your religious practice. So if you went to the temple, the temple prostitutes were there to service the males who went to worship. In small towns where you could, you, you know, the women of the villages would take turns serving as temple prostitutes. Uh, so we're, we're, we're not thinking of prostitutes you know, trolling down Main Street now. They were prostitutes, but in the service of their, um, of their religion at the time. Infant side was a big problem, especially among Gentiles. Uh, boys were prized, girls less so, and so many female children were simply left to die out in the fields. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the uh, uh, marks of Christianity that set Christians apart at that time was that they would rescue these, these children that, that, no one, uh, that no one wanted. Uh, child abuse, uh, terrible. Orphans were raised to be thieves or prostitutes. Um, as far as the uh, religious life is concerned, uh, Jews' uh, temple worship was you know, the center of their life. A cycle of feasts on a yearly basis. Regular synagogue worship was the lifeblood of the community. And most, uh, most of the world practiced emperor worship at that, at that time. So into this turbulent world comes Jesus Christ. Born in Bethlehem to a poor couple, raised as a young Jewish boy, attending synagogue and temple worship, learning how to read, entering public ministry at age 30, confronting the Pharisees and the priests. Believe me, this little background that I've given you now will you know, speak largely when we begin looking at the dialogues that Jesus has with these people. Um, he gives them the news that He's the Messiah. You know? I mean, they're all expecting you know, all these fantastic ideas about the Messiah and this, what, this guy from Nazareth, are you serious, from, from Galilee? He's the Messiah? Wow, what a downer that is, what a disappointment. He's hailed as king, he's killed as a criminal, he's resurrected to demonstrate his deity and lordship. So Matthew, one of his disciples, writes about him and next week we're going to start studying Matthew's eyewitness account of Jesus. So here's the assignment, not you know, this is a class. I want you to learn something, okay? So read chapters one to three. That's not a huge task. But I want you to get a notebook and I want you to write down two things. One, 
main section titles. In other words, in Matthew chapter one, if you begin reading in chapter one, verses two, uh, you know, all the way down to verse 17, is just the genealogy. So as you read that, in your notebook, just put Matthew one, and then just put a bullet and put genealogy verses two to 17, that's all. And then, I also want you, while you're reading verses one, two, and three, or chapters one, two, and three, I want you to record any nuggets that you find. You know what I mean by nuggets? You're reading you know, and you go, oh, wait a minute, I never noticed that before. Hmm, that's interesting. Write that down. So hopefully by the time we're finished, Matthew, you yourself will have a notebook with a lot of good material for you to reflect on, pray over, and if you have an opportunity to teach or to do a devotional or to share with someone else, you'll have something that you yourself discovered. And I'll help you put it into context with the classes that we do. So that's why I say this is not simplistic, Matthew for beginners, but it will be complete. You'll really know Matthew when we finish this, and I hope that you'll have something you know, valuable to, to kind of take away from it. All right, all right, that's it. Thank you very much for your kind and deliberate attention.